I'd encourage you to keep your Bibles open. We're going to be working exposition through this passage of Scripture. DTR. DTR. Better known as Define the Relationship. Oh, okay. Let's get married. Mm. <laughs> I know these so called players wouldn't tell you this. But I'm going to be real and say what's on my heart. Let's take this chance and make this love feel relevant. Didn't you know I loved you from the start? Yeah. When I think about all these years we put in this relationship, who knew we'd make it this far? When I think about where we would be if we were to just fall apart, and I just can't stand the thought of you leaving me. Meet me in the altar in your white dress. We ain't getting no younger, we might as well do it. Been feeling all the while, girl, I must confess, Girl, let's get married. I just want to get married. Mm -hmm. Now, for my folks who are 2000s adults who come into age in 2000, you know that that song is called Let's Get Married by the group called Jagged Edge. It came out in the year 2000. This was what we would call their DTR moment in a relationship, define the relationship. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had one of those moments oh, yeah. in a relationship? You've been going out for a while, you're going out on maybe two, three, four dates, at least that's the way it was for me. I know these days some of y'all get to go out on a year long or two, three year long worth of dates, but I didn't get it like that. Uh, but you know there's a certain point in time where after going out, after whining and, and dining and, 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 and going to the movies together, spending time together, not talking with your friends, at least for the fellas and elderly, you have this conversation at a certain point where they want to talk about where we're going in this relationship. In popular culture, that would be called DTR. Let's define this relationship. I remember my DTR moment. It came back in 1997 in the month of January. My bride to be at that time, we were just going out and just finished college. I felt like I was on the top of the hill, showed up in town, took a flight, drove four hours across North Carolina to get on a flight at 4.45 in the morning to fly up to celebrate her graduation moment. I'm sitting in the family room with her grandmother, and we just sit on the couch, you know, Curly Kay got this nice southern smile on her face, and she starts to want to talk to me a little bit. She said, I just want to talk to you a little bit. And, and the first question come out of her mouth is, where are you going with my granddaughter? Amen. And, and, and I, I need to know what are your intentions Amen. with my granddaughter? I, I, you know, I want to know where you're going with this particular relationship. Y'all going out sometimes. I've seen you go to church with us. You've been to dinner with the family. But I need to know what are your intentions. I don't want you to waste your time. You're young adults right now. You've got a lot of years ahead of you, Prefty, and I don't want you to waste the youthful years of your life if you don't know where this relationship is going. She wants to know, what are your intentions? Do you have a job? Can you take care of my granddaughter? Um, how, do you, are you a committed follower of Jesus Christ, or are you just coming right now because you want to spend some time with us? You know how some of us can do, we, we got in church because our girlfriend. And so she wanted to know, define the relationship. She wanted to know my intentions, and as you can see today, we're married, we've been married happily a long time, Amen. almost 22 years that, that I had sincere intentions. But, but at that point in time, that wasn't just my first DTR moment. I also had a DTR moment the month later in February on Valentine's Day. Got a phone call from my from Sister Nikki, Minister Nikki's brother, the older brother, the, yeah. the heir of the family, that wanted to talk to me on the phone and wanted to know, what are your intentions with my sister? I, don't, I haven't met you yet. I've heard a lot of good things about you from my mama and my daddy and from my other siblings, but I want to know what are your intentions? Our moment. For me, it was DTR to find a relationship from some friends and family that, that men, Sister Nikki didn't have to carry, have that conversation with me. And I know in these times which we live, we want to let our kids do whatever they want to do. We, we want to let them make whatever decisions they want to make. But I'm kind of old fashioned. I think there's some things about some old school ways of dating and going that's still relevant today to some of our fathers and mothers Amen. out there. You need to define the relationship with some of your kids. They've been going out a little bit too long. They've been 
living together a little too long. Maybe you need to interject yourself into the conversation and sit up on down and say, it's time for us to have a PTR moment. I need you to define this relationship. We find that in today's society, that when we find in our current culture that we have an attitude or disposition towards the institution of marriage that could probably be summed up in the song by Bruno Mars called Marry Me. It starts out talking about, I want to marry me. I know some of my young folks have heard this song. He says, I want to marry you. I'm in love with you. I want us to get married. But as we get around to the second verse, we find out that they have been drinking and, and he had been a little rash. He said, by the way, by the time we wake up in the morning, if you want to get a divorce, then that'll be all right with me. Oh. I know that's the culture that we live in today. It's the marry me, Bruno Mars type of culture instead of the Al Green, let's stay together to the good and bad to the bad and the bad. Let's stay together. I, I, I know we're in the 21st century, but that's a means that I think is still relevant when we talk about this institution of marriage. Oh, yeah. It's the comedian Chris Rock who says when you that when you think about marriage and being single, you got the loneliness of singleness versus the boredom of marriage. And that's what oh, our young oh. people got to grapple with, that when they think about when they get married, that somehow it gets kind of boring, that if you really want to live, you want to live single. But when you're single, you can't seem to find the right person. You're concerned about being lonely. And that leads to inevitably what we see in our society today where folks, the young people, our millennials, our Gen Z's, have decided to pick the middle ground or the compromise between marriage and mere sexual encounters, that's called hookup, um, by doing cohabitation with the sexual partner. Hmm. This is nothing new in culture. Amen. This is nothing new in society. It is, it's not something that just popped on the scene in the past five or 10 or 30 years, but this has been around a long, long time. This is the context in which we find the Apostle Paul today. The Apostle Paul has a church full of folks who have been saved, been baptized, been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. They on fire for the Lord. Some of them came to the Lord when they was already married and they had some relationships that were going on, some detachments in the world. But after they came to know Jesus Christ, they had some questions to ask about this thing called marriage and, and intimate relations. You know that taboo thing we don't want to like, we don't want to talk about in the church. That in the church, we don't want to talk about sex. We don't want to talk about intimate relations. We don't want to talk about what God has ordained for man and woman to be in a monogamous relationship. And we wonder why our kids show up with kids and not married. We wonder why they learn a lot more in society. They learn a lot more about marriage watching Ellen than what the church has to offer through the word of God. We find that the Apostle Paul, he gets this letter from the church. And, and they're wondering about marriage and how do you do this marriage thing. He, and, he, and he's heard some rumors of what's been happening in the church. And the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, decides, I need to have a DTR moment with my church. I need to define the relationship. I need to help y'all define what a marriage relationship is supposed to look like. And by the time we arrive at verses 1 through 5, the Apostle Paul says there's some important steps we need to take if we're going to define the relationship and first he wants us to know that there's a mutuality of the marriage relationship. Amen. It was right there in the passage. He, 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 he said that you belong to one another. You have authority, power over one another. He says you have a duty to one another. He says you're supposed to keep one another from being tempted that there's mutuality in the marriage relationship. I, I, I know you thought that in the marriage relationship in the Bible, as it says in the book of Ephesians in chapter 5, that wives are supposed to submit to their husbands as the church submits to Christ Jesus. I know that leaves a bad taste in sisters' mouth when they hear that in premarital counseling about this submission to one another. But that's why you got to read the whole truth, all of God's scripture, Lord, and all of God's word is useful for teaching, equipping, the saints for work of ministry. Because right here in the Bible, we find that the marriage relationship is a mutual one. That means you belong to one another. Amen. That means God has given you to one another. So if you date somebody right now, 
you need to be asking yourself, do I believe that God has given me this person? Are we able to work together? Is this some sharing that's happening in this relationship? Or do you find yourself doing all of the work? Let me make it real practical to you. From a sister girl, do you find yourself paying for every single day? Do you find yourself driving him around in your car? Do you find yourself paying for his bills, but he ain't doing that to help you out? That's not a mutual relationship. The context is, he says, it's a mutual relationship when it comes to sexual relations. So in this context, he says, well, wives, you to please your husbands. Yeah, but husbands, you also to please your wives. But then he says, look, the wife has authority over the man's body, and the man has authority over the woman's body. Now, I must admit that as I studied this and trying to figure out what he's trying to get at right here, I got kind of tickled pink when I looked at what he said about this power of the body, that somehow when God brings a man and woman together, there are some things when you get around them that it just gets some control over you, so to speak, that you just can't control yourself when you around them. And some things start to happen in your body. Some things start to happen in your spirit. You don't know what's going on, but you just know they got some control over you. Black Eyed Peas Brothers can help me right here. That's you go. When you got your mind and you know, they done some things to you. Make you act better. Help you to be more gentle. Help you to be kind. You know, when we're doing that courtship, we on our P's and Q's. We on our best manners, but it's some kind of power they got on my body. Not only do the, the ladies got power over the men, the woman, the wife got some power over her husband's body, but the husband got some power over her. The husband got some power over the woman's body. Hmm. Come on, ladies, you know what I'm talking about. And your friends wondering, why you always smiling like that? What did he do to you? Well, why every time you mention his name, why you always texting him all the time? Why y'all always going back and forth? Y'all just came back from going out. Do you have to spend all your time with him? It's just something being around him that make you feel a particular way. They got some kind of power over you. That's why sometimes you find yourself wondering why I keep fooling around with this joke. Why do I keep coming back to this joke? Why do I keep, why do you, every time they tell me that it love me, I feel like SWB being it so weak in my knees? Because you got power over your body. And he says, look, there's a mutuality in the marriage relationship. When we bring it up to the 21st century, very clearly he's talking about an intimate relation. You satisfy one another. You do things that please one another. Now look, fellas, husband, that means that sometimes you're going to have to sit there and do some talking. You're going to have to do some sitting down listening. Sometimes you're going to have to be a therapist sometimes. Sometimes you're going to have to do some hugging and some kissing. You're going to have to get some roses like you should have done on this past Friday. That, that you just can't go get to where your mind is thinking there are some things you need to do that can, you can satisfy that girl of yours or that woman that you call your boo or your wife. But also, ladies, there are some things that you have to do that you do to satisfy your husband. That husbands are not like wives. That, 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 that husbands um, have to be satisfied. That husbands don't all don't do things all the way that wives do things. That, 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 that you have to recognize that God has given you to the giving your spouse to you for you to please your spouse. Don't sit up there and get like because you got saved and you heard a sermon on Sunday and you can shout hallelujah that when you come home, you so holy now that you can't be touched and nobody can give you a hug and you can't be, you so clean and so all that you can't mess your hair up or mess your lipstick up. No, God has given also your husband authority over you also, power over you. He says that's a mutuality in the marriage relationship. Which brings us to the point where you have to really think about the person you're with. Because as I said, it ought to be mutual. You should not be doing all of the work. And it ought to be that if you go to work and if they don't work, they ought to be at home taking care of the house. And, and, and if both of you go to work, then you need to share the responsibility. That's what we cover in premarital counseling. We got to define the relationship. We got to define the roles that you're going to have in your family. Now, what may work in the high tower household may not work in your household. You know, you got to get in where you fit in. You got to work for it. You got to do what will work for your relationship. But it ought not be one-sided. 
And you and, and you, you all not go into the marriage knowing that it's one sided. So like I tell them, if it never changes, if she never changes, if they stay just the way they are right now, we should be okay. Huh. And nobody's happy. Yeah, that's real marriage for you. <laughs> that's real marriage. Don't set too high standards so that you get your heart broken in a few weeks or a few months later that if they never change, you love them so much right now, you love them the way they are now, if that's what you need and that make you happy, then if they never change, that ought to be enough. So you need to examine this mutuality thing while you're dating. That's why you need to date. That's why before you get so intimate, you need to see if you can work together. You need to see that there's some sharing that takes place. Now, I must admit, I'm old school. So when we went out and dated, I paid for it. Now, I'm not talking about what maybe y'all do. I know y'all got the whole 50-50 what Dutch date stuff you do right now. I don't do that kind of stuff. I'm old school. I open the doors and stuff. And I go pull out the seat and stuff. And I'm going to be paying for it myself. So I ain't got to work and check y'all. So we should be going out. McDonald's, Mickey D's, money today, they work Mickey D's. Don't try to do out of hard, don't try to do some fancy Italian restaurant, and then you can't pay your rent next week. <laughs> it ought to be some mutuality in the marriage relationship. You belong to one another. That, that, that you have power and authority over one another's body. Not one person has all of the power in the relationship. You ought to be a power couple where the Holy Spirit is working and it's normative in your relationship. It ought not be just one person make all of the decisions, decide every place you're going to go on a date, every place you want to go on for vacation, everything you're going to eat for dinner. There ought to be some mutuality in the relationship. He says, look, Folks, you sit there questioning and wondering what, what, what should you be doing in your relationship? It ought to be mutual. Amen. That the marriage relationship is a sharing of souls. It's a sharing of hearts. That is nothing worse than one person in the relationship feel like they've given all they can to the relationship, but that other person don't seem like they don't care one little bit about it. Mm. There need to be some mutuality. Pastor Amen. Paul says that, look, that when, if there's some mutuality in that marriage relationship, then you need to also know that then also there is the gift of the marriage relationship. Amen. Yeah. And that when you can look at your mutuality, then you move to the gift. That means that it's a gift. And this word for gift has a reasoning or its definition is rooted in the fact that God gives the gift. Mm -hmm. Now I know it's going to get quiet right here. <laughs> it's going to be like you can pick it. And I know for some of my sisters right now, it's slim pickings right now, it feels like. But it looks for a suitable help, man. But he says, each has been given a gift. He says, you've been given a gift of singleness, or you've been given a gift of marriage. Mm -hmm. Now, you're going to have to come back next week, and we're going to talk about that gift of singleness. Okay. But today, we're going to talk about that gift of marriage. And the question you have to ask yourself is, how do I know I've been given the gift of marriage? Well, it's right here in the Bible. He says, you given a gift of marriage if you don't have no self-control. Mm. Be quiet now because there's some folks in here. Mm, I don't have self-control. So are you saying I'm supposed to be married? Uh-huh. But you got to make sure you got the right person. It is God who gives the gift. Amen. It takes us back to the book of Genesis and chapter 2. Adam was doing the work that God called him to do. Sisters, first of all, it starts with, is he doing the work that God has called him to do? That one that you with. And if he's doing the work that God has called him to do, he's about his business, about his father's business, then God says it is not good for Adam to be by himself. So I will give him a suitable helpmate. Woo. Now look at that. I will give him a suitable helpmate. Adam is just about minding his business, doing his work, the work that God has called him to do, being faithful to what God has assigned him, and then God blesses him and gives him a suitable helpmate. God brings her to Adam. Amen. 
I know your biological clock might be ticking. I know you're kind of wondering, will God give me, can I trust God to give me what I need and give me the kind of spouse that we have a mutual relationship? But I would advise you to make sure that God gives the gift to you. God gives you a gift of marriage. Not everybody has the gift of marriage. Not everybody can be sacrificial in a relationship. Some folks just selfish. They can't share with other people. Some folks try to get married and they're still doing what they was doing when they were single. They want to hang out with their girls, hang out with their boys. They want to keep doing things like they were single, but they want to get the benefits of being married. Now, y'all know what I'm talking about, what the benefits of marriage is, right? Yeah, I think all of you know. And so, but, but, but look, he said, look, you have to have a gift of marriage. God has to do the work and help you with the spouse or the prospective spouse. The reason things are so jacked up in our society is because we live in a world where we want to make the decisions. We want to make the choices. We want to do the picking. And then when it goes wrong, we want God to clean it up. We want to get God to deliver us out of it, but when we was doing it, it was all in our flesh and all in our emotions and feelings. We didn't want God to have nothing to do with it. God was right there watching it in, by the way. And, 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 and God may have blessed you with that person to help you to grow in your holiness, because God gives the gift of marriage. God gives you the ability to be in a, in a relationship with somebody. Amen. When I'm working at Premarital Council, we talk about some of the gifts you need to have to have a healthy marriage. Oh, okay. And some of those gifts that you know if you are able to be in a Christian-based marriage. And I, I know I'm preaching to the choir today, but I'm just a Baptist preacher. I'm not talking to the world right now. We're going to get to them in a few minutes. I'm talking to the folks in the church. We're going to talk about a Christian marriage. Amen. You got the gift of a Christian marriage, and you ought to have your marriage centered in Christ. You ought to be rooted in Christ before you get married. Amen. If you are saved, you need to grow, you need to allow yourself to grow in Christ. But you also need to be able to be friends with the person that you say you love and you want to marry. That they ought to be your best friend. It ought not be somebody else is going to be your best friend and they're going to be one of your friends. But you also ought to be able to forgive if you got the gift for marriage. Because this is going to take a whole lot of forgiving if you marry somebody. It's going to do, I know you witness here to know that it's a whole lot of forgiving you've had to do to your spouse. It's a whole lot of mercy you've had to receive. Oh, I guess I'll just talk for myself. The pastor needs a whole lot of forgiveness in his marriage. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Every now and then I make some mistakes and I got to go and say it's me, oh, me, Lord, standing in the need of prayer and go to my wife and say, I need for you to forgive me. Got the gift of marriage when you can join your finances together. Mm -hmm. That means you don't have no side, no offshore accounts. Yeah, that don't mean that you got some stuff off the books that nobody knows about. Yeah, I'm going to get up in your stuff today. You got a joint account. Everybody knows what's going on. If you drop dead, they'll be able to find all the money. That's what I mean when I say the finances are together. You can work together. Not only if you got the gift of marriage, you're able to manage your finances together. Mm. But you also can raise a family together. Mm. Again, that mutuality. The husband, the wife, both bring something to the table. I know some people you may not be, you may not have the ability to physically bear children, but God still, if He's giving you the Holy Spirit, gives you the ability to raise spiritual children. And, and you gotta be able to work as a family. Now this got some biblical implications because in the church we ought to be able to work together. We ought to be able to raise up spiritual children. The leaders in the church should work to train up and equip the saints for the work of ministry. But also, you got to have some fidelity. Hmm. Don't get married if you're not a one-woman man. Hmm. Are you listening, fellas? Amen. If you need more than one woman, marriage is not a gift you have. I'm, gonna get, I'm going there today. Ladies, if he ain't all that you need, and you need some other stuff, you don't have the gift for marriage. you got to have fidelity. Hmm. But you gotta be able to communicate, like I tell my young couples. That means you gotta be able to talk frank. Mm. Mm. It gets quiet in there. You gotta be able to say what's going on and not cut around the corners. Right. Gotta walk on eggshells in the household because you're afraid they're gonna blow through the roof. 
But I'm not saying God convicted me on this. I know I'm still, I'm a work in progress. Like I said, I need for my wife to forgive me. But you got to be able to have some frank conversations in a marriage. If you can't talk frankly, if you have got some brittle, some brittle pride, and if you want to walk out and leave the house and abandon the family, when somebody lets you know you're wrong or tell you your feet not smelling right or you need to go take a bath or something or what's going on with, with you showing up to work all the time and the money looking funny, if you got a problem with that, you don't have the gift of that. Apostle mm. Paul says, look, it's a gift. God gives, God graces folks to be mad. Not everybody's meant to be mad. That there's some folks God don't give you the gift, but he gives you the gift of singleness. We're going to talk about that next week. It ain't nothing wrong with being single. We just got to deal with how you manage those urges and those things that's going on with you that really only works in the context of marriage. Amen. Got to grow in your holiness, so to speak, as I think as we were talking about this. You got to be more holy. He says, look, church, you all, we got to define the relationship. And if we're going to talk about marriage, there must be some mutuality in the relationship. It's give and take, it's sharing on both sides. You know this before you get married. So you need to deal with these issues before you walk down the aisle and get your heart broken. He says, look, it's a gift of marriage. Not everybody has the gift. God is not giving that to everybody. Not everybody got a forgiving heart when it comes to some things that can happen in a marriage context. But he says also, third and finally, that there's a charge to the marriage relationship. This is where he spends most of his time in the passage. We write in verse 10. He spends most of the time talking about the charge of the marriage relationship. In other words, there are some commands of the marriage relationship. There are some responsibilities that God gives you in the marriage relationship. There is a purpose of the marriage relationship. You just didn't get together to sleep in the bed and make one another feel good and stay warm at night. There are some responsibilities that God gives to the marriage relationship. That's why Paul says, not I, but the Lord God, Jesus, give this charge. And that's important because it's the Lord Jesus. And most of us know that the Lord Jesus ain't running our household. And it ain't the Lord Jesus up in our bedroom with our spouse. There's some devil up there. There's some foolishness going on in some of our houses. But it's not the Lord Jesus. That's why he says the Lord Jesus is the charge. Because marriage is instituted by God. God created marriage. And if God created marriage, then God gets to give the definition for how the marriage is supposed to function. But Apostle Paul says, I need to give you some commands. I need to give you a charge of what the marriage relationship is supposed to be. Now, I know some of you saying charge, and that's what marriage feels like sometimes, like a big charge, like it's a big debt, like it's a big cost. But that's not the charge he's talking about. It's costing you a lot of money to walk down the aisle. That ain't what he told me. He said it's a charge, it's a responsibility. He says, look first, he gives a charge to the believers. Spends just a few verses on believers. Watch this song. This is a blessing for some of our sisters and brothers who got an unsaved spouse at home. We got some for you in a few minutes. But first, he says, I need to give a charge to the ones who are saved. If husband and wife are both saved, he says, I'm going to give you a charge. He first gives it to the sisters. He says, Look, do not separate from your husband. Ooh, it's going to get tough for Separate. This is an interesting word, too. Because separate means to depart from someone, to leave or separate oneself. And what he was getting at right here is the wife says, this ain't working out. I need to, I need to do like the other say, it's upgrade. And so I need to get me something else. I need to separate. And, it, and, and But also this word separate has connotations in the context when you think about a female that you can be separated and living in the same house. Ooh. You can be in the same house, sleeping in the same bed, and be separated. Mm -hmm. that, that, that the love doesn't run out. The joy doesn't run out. You don't even want them to touch you at night. You, you perfectly content to pour the covers over you and wrap yourself up like a mummy. You have separated yourself from your spouse. Going real, we're going all in today. He says, look, he says, look, there's a charge I give you. Do not separate. Do not get rid of your spouse. 
And now I'm going to give you my, 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 my disclaimer in here. The Apostle Paul is not talking about if your spouse putting their hands on you, sisters. If he putting his hands on you, run like Forrest God. Don't let him put his hands on you. I told you before, let my daughter give me some light put her hand on her. And if he cheated on you, he ain't talking about that either. Because he already know what Jesus already said about being, being unfaithful. He said, look, that's your exit ramp. If they cheating on you. And unfaithfulness ain't just cheating on you intimately. They could also be putting their hands on you. But you're a child of God. As the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, what man will hurt himself? And if you hurt, put your hands on your wife, then you hurt yourself. So you're unfaithful to yourself. That's awesome. Woo. That's fine. He said, look, don't separate. And he said, not just physically, but don't separate emotionally because they lay you down. Because they fall in short of the glory. They keep screwing up. Us husbands, we, we take a little while to grow up. My mother-in-law told me, she told my wife early on, he's not going to grow up till you're about 25. <laughs> she, she, she 21, he's going to take him 25 to just start growing up. Amen. Amen. That's real. That's what psychology said. Men don't grow up. For a while. Amen. Amen. It sounded like Peter Pan. <laughs> don't want to grow up and never grow up. Amen. Don't marry a Peter Pan. Amen. <laughs> you can't make a Peter Pan into a working man. He says, look, don't separate if you are a Christian. If both of you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, work that thing out. I know right now, there may be some couples in here, you on the verge, you know, they say, they don't even come to church, they, 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 they kind of iffy, it seems like with the faith thing, but you know that they believe in Jesus Christ, you know if they pass away, you will want to come to the pastor and you want to tell me to roll them out here and give a eulogy and say they up in heaven already, and if you think they're going to be up in heaven when it's time to eulogize them, then you cannot separate from them physically, nor emotionally, nor mentally, nor spiritually. Don't give up. Amen. Get some counseling, in other words. Woo. Amen. Apostle Paul says, look, I've I looked couples and you're married. That's husbands and wives. If, 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 if husbands should get on your nerve, see like nothing you do is right. <laughs> Complaining about everything. Get home one minute late. Complaining. If you go out there and cut the lawn, you cut it too low. You know, you know, you sat up there, you were supposed to go to the store to get, you were supposed to go get some milk, you brought some whole milk, she said, skim milk, you ought to know that by now. He said, look, do not separate. Based on this interesting. But he moves to the, that's the wise, but then he moves to the husband, he switches the language to say, husbands, do not divorce your wife. Because hmm. in the times, in the culture, the husbands could just put away their wife. Mm. They could just get rid of that wife. They could have an argument one night and say, I'm out. That's why I tell you, I would never cohabitate with nobody, live with nobody, because we got no commitment. We have an argument or a disagreement, I'm out. See, you see, when you're married, it's much deeper. Because when it's married, you just can't leave so easily. When you walk down here and stood before the Lord God and said, to death do us part from sickness and health, from, from, uh, for, for good or bad, I'm in it to win it. It ain't so easy to leave. <laughs> Sister girl, don't waste the years of your youth. Wait. Them to get it together. I remember I had a cousin. I remember when, when they were, my parents called and my mom cousin, they, 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 they were young and 20s. I was a little kid, waiting on them to put a ring on. Now they're 60 something. Bitter. Because he never put a ring on. Married somebody else. Mm. He said, look, it's mutual. He says, look, it is a gift. Remember how I said that person. If you are dating and they don't want to go to church, just, just take the pain now and move on. You love Jesus and they don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. 
you want to read the Bible and they don't want to read the Bible? That, that you want to go to Bible study and they want to do something else? Move on. Because once you get married and it takes time, mm. if you're not equally yoked, he says do not separate. Physical and emotional. But then he says husbands do not divorce. And like I said, in divorce, they can just put away their wife because they have a disagreement. See, and that's how you know the Bible is so true about humanity. Now that's where us men are, right? We have, we, we're, we're zero to a hundred, like the can say. Why, what, like one of my friends would say, why y'all always go from zero to a hundred? Why is no grade with y'all? <laughs> we all get amped up, be quiet, and we get amped up passive aggressive. That's what many of us men are like. And he said, look, husband don't divorce because we are quick to not be able to stay in the firm. Yeah, we quick when it ain't going right. We're trying to look at some other options. He says, look, if you Christians and you say, you cannot divorce your wife. It's a charge. God said this. You walk down there, it's she yours. And work it out. Mm -hmm. I tell my couples, you, let's go look at Ephesians chapter 5. Look, she got a problem submitting to you because you don't look like Christ. If you were looking and acting like Christ, she would have no issue with you leaving the household. She want to get rid of you and fight you every way on every single decision because when she looks at Jesus, she looks at you, she got enough sense in the head to say, you ain't nothing like Jesus. And so when she reads in Ephesians chapter 5, he said, you're supposed to die and give your life up for your wife like Christ gave his life up for the church. He said, you ain't going to sacrifice I'm going to sacrifice you tomorrow. If I'm going to sacrifice you, Sure, I can be silly and foolish on the phone. He says you can't just walk out. And the problems that you're dealing with in your household probably starts with you. Because mm. your job is to help make a holy. This is Bible. Mm. This is the Bible. She tripping out, cussing, and, and, and wilding out on you and tripping out on you. How much have you been doing to wash up with the word? Mm. <clears throat> How much you read the word to them? How many Bible studies y'all having together? How many times you the one saying, let's go to church today? <laughs> let's go to Bible study today. Hmm. He says, no. That's mutuality in the marriage relationship. It's a share. It's a give and take. He says, it's a gift of marriage. You got to be given the gift of marriage. Not everybody got the gift. But you know you got the gift if you don't have self-control. Because you're supposed to be holy. And if you're a Christian, you can't do anything with your body. We learned about that a few weeks ago. You want to be holy as God is holy. If you can't control yourself, if you feel you need to be with your, your boo, and you need to do the things that spouses do, husbands and wives do, then you need to get married. See, I knew I did not have the gift of singleness really early on in my life. Amen. So I got married really young. Some of us want to act like we got the gift of singleness and we don't have the gift of singleness. Amen. And some of us want to act like we got the gift of marriage, but we selfish. We can't work with nobody. We can't build nothing together. We can't work as a team. You don't have the gift of marriage. But if you don't have self-control, you do. If you date, you probably do. That's simple. But then he says, not only you got to believe in the household. But I love this. But this is many of our experiences for some of, some of you. He says, look, also there's a charge to the one who is married to an unbeliever. Now this is what's deep. It's deep. You got to look deep. He said, and if they consent to stay with you, then you got to stay married to them. This is deep. Mm. He said, you showed up at church or you on fire for the Lord. And they like, you are a little bit too on fire for Jesus. You talking about the Bible every time you come home. You talking about the sermon every single Sunday. You up and got the sermon um, projected on the screen from your smartphone. And all that folks can see is what happened at church. You up and tweeting and putting stuff up on Facebook about what difference Jesus has made in your life. And, and they don't really want to have no part of Jesus, but they're going to put up with you because they love you. Amen. They don't want Jesus, but they want you. You can't get rid of them if they consent to stay with you. Right, right, right. Look at this. You can see where this is going. He said, you on fire for Jesus, but they not on fire. They, they don't follow Jesus, but they say, I'm going to stay in this thing because I love you. 
So you can't get rid of it. That means you can't show up and say, why aren't you saved by now? Mm. After all this I've been telling you about Jesus, why aren't you following Jesus now? And they say, well, look, when you married me, I wasn't following Jesus. Mm. <laughs> and you, you following Jesus, but I'm not following Jesus. No. You can't get rid of him. Now watch it. Because there's something greater that's happening. But he says, not only for husbands, but also for wives. And he says, look, you can't get rid of them because they don't believe. That means you can't when some new person show up at church. They don't fight for the Lord. But your spouse ain't on fire for the Lord. And you're like, well, I want that. So I start scheming to get rid of them because I see something better has come along. They consented to stay in the marriage, even though they're gonna have to hear you talk about Jesus all the time. It's implied, you say, I'm not compromising my faith for you, but it's I'll still stay in this thing, even though you're not compromising your faith. You can't get rid of them. It's because you see something better you want to upgrade to. Amen. Because hmm. <laughs> here's the point he's trying to bring you as we come down the mountain now. <laughs> Because he's saying there's a greater purpose in that. You being holy can help get the whole family holy. Yes. Yes. He said, the wife is she holy, that means she's acting and being holy. That means she don't show up clowning and tripping out and getting loud because they didn't go to church. But she said, if you are holy, like it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, you're not trying to win it with your physical beauty and how you look on the outside, but on the inward side what Jesus Christ is doing in your life. Yeah. It's implying that who knows, perhaps you being patient and being kind and being gentle may work and break down some barriers in their heart. And you may help for them to be holy, but even deeper than that, one holy person in the family can change the whole art for the whole family. That one holy parent can help get the children saved. That you don't go give up when you think you need some better spouse because they don't know the Lord, but you know the Lord. You train the kids up in the Lord so that when they grow old, they will not depart. You bring the children to church and introduce them to Jesus Christ. You keep the Bible to the kids and let them know about Jesus Christ. You bring the baby to the Bible school and let them know how much you love Jesus Christ. You let them know how much of a difference is made in your life. Jesus, and you want to follow Jesus, be, 
Be like James, James Cleveland said that Jesus is the best person, best I've ever had, the best I've ever had in life. When, when, when he released that last night song, he said, Jesus is the best thing I've ever known. And when I look at my life, I look at how good it's been since I've known Jesus Christ, I know I have a better life. I know I'm living better. I know that I'm blessed and I'll be faithful. Don't lose your peace and your salvation because they don't want to follow Jesus. You know Jesus. They don't want to follow. They make you want to choose between Jesus. I'm choosing Jesus. Amen. As I prepare to close, I'm reminded that there's something else here in the view of the passage. There's something else that he wants us to see right there that's shrouded, right there in that verse 16. Because I just said, he said that, that who knows whether or not you can save your spouse. That, that you don't know whether or not they're going to get saved. You may have to live with them a long, long time and they may not know Jesus Christ. That, that you can't get them saved. But there is somebody that can save. There is somebody else that does offer salvation. And that somebody also calls us to DTR, to find the relationship. That person is named Jesus Christ. That's why it says in my Bible when he asked Peter, who do the people say that I am? And he said, well, they say they say all kind of people, but really, who do you say I am? That means he says we got to define the relationship. And he says you are the son of the living God. He says on this rock I will build my church in the gates of hell will not prevail. Because we're going to have a little relationship. He says, look, I don't call you servant, but I call you friend. I show you the things of my father because you're in the family because we got a mutual relationship. He says, my sheep know my voice. So when the enemy comes, they know how to run. That's a mutual relationship. But my father tells me in Romans chapter 6, 23, that all of the sins are for the Lord right there. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life. That you get eternal life, and that's a gift from God. That is the gift that God gives when you define your relationship with Jesus Christ. But my Bible says he also gives a charge to the church. So he says, let's go to make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey all of my commands. There's no opportunity to give the time. That's a charge. But he also gives a charge to the preacher in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, I charge you to preach in season and out of season. Preach whether they want to hear it or not hear it. Because it was Jeremiah who said, every time I don't want to preach, it's like fire shut up in my bones. Because it's the preaching of the gospel that saves. That's why Paul says in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, it's the power of the cross that saves folks. I know maybe you thought you could get him saved. But he needs to see Jesus Christ in you and get drawn to Jesus Christ. He needs to get contact with the spirit of the living God. He needs to see that you're light and salt. That he sees you to work and praise your father in heaven. That's the charge that he gives to the church. To preach the gospel in season, out of season. Preach it whether you don't want to hear it. That's what it means for the Christian. And the Bible Paul said, you can't give up on your marriage. Because your marriage is a presentation of the church. Our Jesus Christ watch the church with the sense of the word. Come on, men, you need to get more in the Bible and watch your wife with the sense of the word. It says the wives submit to themselves as Christ the church to Christ. That when you got a marriage with respect and love, you know what the church is supposed to be about. The church is the bond. Church 
the husband is supposed to represent Jesus Christ as Jesus Christ is the head of the church. That was the, child. the husband sacrifices and dies to himself, just like Jesus Christ died on the cross for the church. So you come to me and say, I can't get an act right in how much dying you've been dying on the cross. How much sacrifice have you done for that family? How much word have you been pouring into that family? And then the church is supposed to submit to Jesus Christ. Why is you respect your husband? God gave it to you. Don't disrespect him out in public. Don't talk to him like a, like a dog just because he's screwing up. God gave it to you. And your marriage is supposed to reflect the church. Let the church say amen. amen.